attaches to the moment of non-being in Dasein. So, if Dasein is the unity of being and non-being, he says this this is the moment. This is determinacy. So he, you know, that, so it's one of the well, I would say one of the few places, but it is a place in which he specifically says. Um, page 110. Non-being taken up into being constitutes determinacy as such. Because it's sort of uh, because rather than nothing, you're relating it to a non-being that's giving the being sort of determinacy. Well, what Hegel's doing here is defining what counts as determinacy. Determinacy, as I say, is, is think of it Think that Dasein is the unity of being and non-being. It's got to be the it's got to be the unity of being and the not. But it's the unity of being and a not that is itself inseparable from being, hence non-being. So the unity of being with non-being, the name, excuse me, that he attaches to that moment of non-being is bestimmtheit. That's just so what you call it. So then, when the term the idea of determinacy comes up later on you know that that determinacy is non-being, or being not. It doesn't matter which way around you have it. Um, and is that to do with the fact that you had this unity of being and nothing from the sort of earlier stage? Yes, the being and nothing first vanish into one another, and then collapse into a single unity in which they are inseparable. So they've got to think, well, what does it mean for being and nothing to be inseparable? Okay, It means you can't have being without the not, you can't have not without being. So you have being plus a not being. Okay, now that's not telling you very much. But you know you've got to have that. So then, he says, well, we've, we've already named being being, so we'll just stick with that. Um, the whole package he calls Dasein, but the moment of non-being in Dasein he calls determinacy, and that's why we can then translate Dasein as determinate being. So the difference between simple being and determinate being is made by the addition of that element of non-being. You, know, you, you can just see it. You know. You've got being plus non-being. Take that away, and you've just got being again. So this is the element of non-being of determinacy. Okay? But non-being doesn't just hover around by itself. Non-being in Dasein is a non-being that is. This is separate from being. That he calls quality. Okay, so quality is just determinacy, not by itself in abstraction, but as one with being. So quality is just sort of Dasein from a different point of view. Dasein is being that's one with determinacy. And quality is determinacy that's one with being. There's a slightly different accent, but they're the same structure. And then he notes that this itself, quality, can be given two different accents. <coughs> it can be non-being that is, negation, or non-being that is, reality. And so those are the two forms that quality and ultimately, determinacy must take. Does that? Yeah, yeah, yeah. Does that get it? That, that yeah. Goes. It's just, it's quite important to actually, this, <coughs> I'm glad you raised this, because it's quite important to get the idea of determinacy and not confuse it with a later category, which is determination. So there's, a, there's, there's in, in uh, determinacy or determinateness is the Stiftheit, but then we've already been done. The, the, the colleague yeah, yours came in. Oh, here we are. Oh, please yeah. come on. Do you want to do it again? <laughs> <laughs> Thank you. Okay, come on. Uh, they, they, they check up on the, 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 the rooms being used. It's a survey they do, you know, twice a year or something, just to make sure that the rooms are being used. And so if rooms aren't being used, because uh, I suppose people book rooms and then don't use them properly, and so they want to make sure that, that the rooms are actually being used for, uh, for this module, that's why. 
Um, okay, so that's Bestimmtheit. But there is another word, Bestimmung, which um, I suppose is most famous from uh, Fichte's, the vocation, often translated as the vocation of man, die Bestimmung, die Bestimmung des Menschen, which is this word, Bestimmung. Now that comes up later in the logic, and that is translated as determination. Now it's very important that you not confuse these two. So that's why I have said about learning Hegel is a little bit like learning a language. You, you just have to learn how the terms work. Um, and it's a, you know, and as with all languages, he, he's, there's an element of consistency and sometimes elements of inconsistency as well. But anyway, that's what the shift kind of is. So sometimes I might talk about you know, things being determinate. Well, Hegel might do that. And then you've got to think, okay, being determinate means not just being, but in being, being not, okay, not dot, dot, dot. That's how you are determined. Whether that moment of non-being is explicit or not, that's why I said with the idea of the ends realissimum, which is meant to be you know, the, the, the most real being, it's only real. There's no negation there at all. In Hegel's view, there are two alternatives. Really. Either you really mean the ends realissimum with no negation, in which case you've got pure being, which is in fact there's nothing. Or you don't really mean it, and you are in fact smuggling in an element of determinacy. You're thinking of the ends realissimum as this, not that. You're just not building into it, it's being this, not that. But of course, if you are thinking of it that way, it's not just the most real being, because it's got negation in it, because being determinate is being this, not that. Hey, you can't, you know, it's got to be one of those two. There can't be, in Hegel's world, pure affirmativeness that is determinate. It's a logical impossibility. Even though we know there are plenty of philosophers who thought you could have that, Spinoza being one of them. Spinoza, the difference between the attributes of thought and extension is a difference between two forms of being that are purely affirmative. There is no negation. Spinoza says explicitly there's no negation in those attributes. They are purely affirmative. And yet they are immediately different and in that sense affirmative. So Hegel, the only way that Hegel can deal with that is by saying, look Spinoza, you're not really being honest. They in fact, if they're determinate, negation is part of them. Because otherwise you can't have any different. And of course this then becomes an issue with Deleuze uh, uh, later. And also with Schelling, there are moments in Schelling too where Schelling seems to want to have difference without negation. I can't remember where it is, but there's a part where he thinks that, that God differentiates itself just by saying yes to itself over and again. So yes, 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 and that generates differences. <coughs> Hegel says, no, 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 I can't have it. So, you know, and I mean, my point here is to get you to understand what Hegel's uh, doing, but... Um, so does that? Yes. Oh, yeah, good. Okay, but we'll come back to it. Don't worry. Don't worry. Yes. Uh, so um, this week, I think the first time you've talked about you've talked about using the logic in concrete in concrete places. Mm -hmm. So you have you gave an example of talking about a, another or the other as such. You have shared example into your discussion of universality and particularity when you introduce self relation. Mm -hmm. And I've got kind of two closely related questions that I think you'll probably be able to answer both at once. So I'll present them together. The first one is. What's the what? When we're dealing with particular examples, like right? in the domain of particularity, mm -hmm. even when we're thinking about a, a universal, or thinking about a particular universal rather than universality as such, and the concrete rather than the abstract, what's the want for carrying over our conclusions from the non-particular and abstract logic into the particular and concrete world? That's the first question. The second one is, by what mechanism does this carryover happen? Even if there's a justification for the logic functions the same in the particular and concrete world, what mechanism governs the carryover? Is it some kind of, do these categories double as factors or something like that? Um, no, I mean, it's a good question. And the, and the warrant is ultimately, I suppose, in the philosophy of nature and the philosophy of spirit. Mm -hmm. I mean, it's not in the logic. Um, because it just happens. Um, well. the, 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 that Hegel's conclusion at the end of the logic is that logic isn't just logic. You know, the, 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 the logic itself makes nature necessary, and indeed in such a way that in fact everything we're talking about has no being other than in nature. 
So, you know, we start with the logic, but when we got to nature, we realized that what we started with was really an abstraction, an undetermination, <coughs> because what there really is is space, time, and matter. Again, like Spinoza. You know, substance doesn't precede nature, it's one with nature. And in fact, when you think through the implications of Hegel's logic, logic, reason, logos, is one with nature and one with spirit. So when you get the whole system, you ask Hegel, what is there, Hegel? Nature and spirit. That's what there is. With reason imminent in the two of them. Um, so that's the warrant. Ultimately, so what Hegel has to show is that being takes the form of space, time, matter. Particular moving spaces, chemical, physical, organic beings. Um, and then, of course, in the philosophy of being and spirit, then you know, self-conscious beings with memory, language, and all this, blah, 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 blah. The mechanism, I think, although not everyone agrees with that, is the same as it is in the logic. But, but this is a difficult problem. Some people think that Hegel develops the logic sort of imminently and then applies it to the world. Yeah, I, possibly. I see no evidence that that's what he does, and, and, and he specifically denies that that's what he does. But anyway, people think that's what he did. Um, the other way of thinking about it is that, that logic works through its determination and then reaches a point at which it makes necessary a constellation that is no longer purely logical. It turns into its opposite, and that then is nature. And then nature itself has its own dynamic, which is structured by but not reducible to uh, the logic. That's the way I take it. So I think that the moves within the philosophy of nature are uh, um, further developed forms of, but not re reducible back to, what's going on in the, uh, in the logic. But of course, that's for a different module. So no, a perfectly valid question. Um, I mean, there are other things. When we get to the philosophy of spirit, Hegel will argue, in fact, some of Hegel's thoughts are very close to Kant's. Namely, that not only do these categories structure nature, but they structure our consciousness and experience of nature. And so for us to be able to be aware of something like this, is to employ tacitly or overtly the category of something. My fish swimming around don't look at this and think something. They can't. They don't have that within them. Um, and so there are no somethings in their world. Hegel's got to ask you. Um, so there's that twofold justification, uh, I think. But yes, you're right. I'm, I'm, I'm trying to bring in more examples, and examples always have uh, dangers attached to them. But what I'm trying to get across is that Hegel's derivation of the idea of something isn't, you know, that as, as he puts it, the absolute isn't up there. The absolute's here. The absolute, there's not another space that's occupied by the absolute. The absolute is here. And the claim is a very Kantian one, that without the concept of something, we would not be able to experience or have any encounter with something. I'm going to leave you pondering, and then um, um, I think Tom, you had a question. Um, it wasn't just a question; it was just a comment about um, ethos and or something. Oh, um, so it was just in the immediate philosophy of writing. So I'm teaching. Which you have to be reading. Yeah. Right. Well, I haven't been teaching. Yeah. Though, so this is why this is why I remember this. Yeah. yeah. So <clears throat> it's where he does in the addition to section 207, he does say when a human being must be by well, translated as somebody, but then in brackets the editor of this who you know. It's me. Yeah. Um, <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Right? Um, so just pointing this out. So you know, when he says the human being must be somebody who must belong to a specific state, so you know, this way he's arguing that in order to be a substantial person in yeah. this, this social context, you need to be, you need to have a job basically. Um, or you need yeah. to do so, have some exclusive sphere in society. So yeah. you need to differentiate yourself. Yeah. Although, yes. Although it's interesting that actually at that point. He's not using the term edvas in this sort of bare right. beginning sense. Yeah. But edvas has already been developed into something determinate. Okay. Because, of course, we can't, yeah. human beings, if human beings were just something. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. In a way, I suppose you could say that as abstract persons, we are just something. We're kind of just self relating subjects with no further qualifications. Mm. But in that point, yeah. we're, yeah. Well, yeah, we're in abstract right away. Yeah. <coughs> Maybe more so. 
Yeah, I mean, just whatever. Just, <laughs> just, just <laughs> having a. We don't know yet. Just um, having an immediate yeah. identity. But and, and and in fact, it's worth noting, by the way, and this came up in, in response to it during the break to another question, that although we've got this difference, particularly this difference, we've been determined at being something. What happens from now on is that Hegel will claim that to be something will itself prove to be something determined. And so you'll get, by the time we get to limit, you'll get the two coming together. So a limited something, as something, is a self-relating unit. But insofar as it's limited, it's this, not that. And the two are inseparable from one another. And so Hegel's going to argue, having distinguished the two thoughts, that in fact you can't have them apart from one another. So to be something is always to be something limited. Um, and I want to say a little bit about the negation of negation. In fact, maybe I'll just take a, a, a moment to, um, uh, to, to comment on that, actually, if that's okay. Um, the negation of the negation, I've indicated, really has, has sort of two sides to it. The simplest side to it is that something is a negation of negation because Something is determinate, and being determinate involves negation. But something is not just being determinate, because to be something is to be self-relating, not just being this, not that. So it's being the negation of the negation. But in that phrase, the negation of the negation, without getting too complicated, the first negation can't just repeat the second one. Because then you would just have being determinately not determinate, which wouldn't get us really what we want. Hegel's point is that being something is a different structure that we haven't had yet. And so it can't be captured in terms that have come before. It's a new structure. So something as the negation of the negation is not just being determinate by virtue of being self-relating. And the argument goes two ways. Something is the negation of the negation because it's self-relating. And in being the negation of the negation, it is a self-relating negation. A negation that applies to itself. And you can't really settle on one or the other. Both come together. Now that idea of being the negation of the negation, at the minute, as well, loses its negative quality insofar as it becomes constitutive of something. Something which is affirmative, which is on the side of being, you know, being reality and something. But when we get to the idea of finitude, that moment of the negation of the negation will become explicitly negative. So the reason why every something is finite for Hegel is because the negation of the negation that it always is as something turns out to be explicit self-negation, self-destruction. <coughs> so finitude isn't added on to being something externally. It's just the result of rendering explicit what it is to be something, which is the negation of the negation. Now, you don't know that yet, and there's no reason why you should believe me at this point, but that when you go to finitude and you look back, you'll think, well, blimey, that just rendered explicit that. So it means... The idea that something is the negation of the negation is made necessary by this difference, but it contains the seeds of that something self-destruction. So finite things will destroy themselves simply by being what they are. Um, all right, I think um, I want to say a little bit about the other, um, just because it seems to me that there is a uh, I think there's good reason for thinking, for understanding why something and other belong together. But Hegel's own account of uh, the other in the concluding paragraph um, just before finitude does seem to me to be problematic. Um, and I want to just indicate briefly why. So the paragraph is on 116 in the, um, in the Miller. It's the, as a concluding paragraph before Finitude. Um, and Hegel, if you look sort of three, four lines down, he says, something is and is then also determined to be. Further, it is in itself also becoming, which, however, no longer only has been and nothing for its moments. 
One of these being is now determinate being, and further but determinate being. The second is equally undetermined being, but determined as the negative of something and other. Now that last bit, it seems to me, is not problematic. I think that's perfectly consonant with, with the way that Hegel is developing here. Namely, something is quality, self-related quality, as it were, with an affirmative accent, and given the logical history of something, it's going to emerge also as self-relating being with a negative accent. So there's no reason to worry about something and other. Something and other are equiprimordial in Hegel's account. They both come in together. But Hegel's own account does seem to me to be uh, strange because it looks as if it <coughs> introduces the idea of other on the basis of an anticipation, which, of course, in imminent thinking, we're not allowed to make. So something is, and is also a determinate being. Further, it is in itself also becoming. Well, yeah, absolutely fine. But that's to come later. We can't use that now to derive consequences for being something now. That's verboten. You can't say that where we are now is the promise of what's to come. Ergo, that's going to have these qualities to it. That's not allowed. So I'm sort of you know, slightly mystified as to why he's done that. And it seems to me that that is not a legitimate derivation. You can't, in an imminent account, do that. You know, my own view is that, as I said before, it doesn't affect the actual derivation of something or another. But if you're reading it and being surprised by it, um, or maybe there's some other, maybe I'm misreading that, then there's some other way to take that. Um, OK, um, I do want to move on. But on the other hand, I also want to make sure that any questions about this are discuss so nobody's got anything. Okay, I'm going to move on. Um, something or other. The account of something or other is um, uh, initially quite uh, straightforward. Um, it has three basic stages. Um, so you're looking under finitude, uh, not the first ABC, because that's sort of you know, uh, anticipating where, it's good, where we're going to go, but A, something or other. Um, and you can see in the first place, secondly, and then there's a thirdly over the page. Okay, so, first of all, um, something and other are in the first place both determinate beings or somethings. That's simply noting that something and other both have the structure of self-relating being and so are both something. That's reflected in our language where we say, here's something, here's something else. Here's something, here's something other. The other is another something. It's a something with, as it were, negative accent. Second point, something and other are both also equally other. As he says, it is immaterial which is first named, and solely for that reason called something. When there is reciprocity, the, uh, sorry, the, um, uh, in Latin, when they both occur in a sentence, both are called aliud, or the one, the other, alius, aliud. If two things, if of two things we call one A and the other B, then in the first instance, B is determined as the other, but A is just as much the other of B. Both are in the same way others. So something and other are sort of reversible concepts. That is not what was said about reality and negation. What was said about reality and negation is that they are a fixed determinate difference, each of which contains the other. Not that they're reversible. Being and nothing, too, are not reversible. They vanish into one another. But something and other are reversible. So again, you see, there's a different structure here and a different logic. Take the idea that something and other are both other. And take the thought that if you start with A, then that's something. B is other than that. If you start with B, then A is other than that. So what otherness means at this point is being other than. And indeed, something is only another insofar as it's other than something else. So if, impossibly, you had something and other, and you took away the something, the other wouldn't be other, it would just be something. 
It's only some it's only another by virtue of being other than the first something. This is what he's getting at in the uh, second paragraph, you know, under secondly, you've got the long paragraph where he talks about this and it's all stuff to, that's related to sense certainty. Um, and then the second paragraph, otherness, otherness thus appears. <coughs> otherness thus appears as a determination alien to the determinate being thus characterized, or as the other outside the one determinate being. Partly because a determinate being is determined as other only through being compared by a third, and partly because it is only determined as other on account of the other which is outside it, but is not an other on its own account. So initially here, being other is being other than. And so being other is a determination that the other enjoys only as a function of something else being there. You can't, as it were, be other all by yourself <coughs> at this point. This is the first example, it seems to me, of what we get throughout the other parts of the logic, of a kind of an external determinacy, where you get a character, a, a, a categorial determination that belongs to X, but it doesn't belong to X intrinsically, it belongs to X sort of externally. But it's been imminently developed. And it's very important that you not think that just because the logic as a whole is imminent, that every relation that will arise in the logic is itself an imminent internal relation. That's not true. And here you can see that. The logic generates relations, some of which are external. Now, the externality is not here an accident. It's a function of the fact that the two are self-relating and therefore separate, apart from one another. So this is not only the beginnings of the subject, it's the beginnings of externality, too. Whereas these two are bound together inseparably. These two are apart from one another. And as a function of that, being other is itself an external determination. Other here means being other than. Okay, let's move on, because that is the sort of straightforward bit, really. Um, but Hegel now introduced a third idea, which highlights another aspect, or the other aspect of being other, and that is that the other is itself self-relating being with the accent on the negative. And as such, the other then, as he puts it at the end of the paragraph just immediately before thirdly, the other is an other on its own account, apart from the something. It's the other für sich außerhalb des So what follows from that? That's what he's now going to look at. This picks up the point I was making earlier, that the other itself requires us to think of the other as standing alone, as just the other. So there's an ambiguity in the thought of being other. Being other is being other than, but it's also just being other. And both of those are involved in being other. And if you think about it, it's perfectly clear why that should be the case. Because being other stands on its own because it stands apart from being something. But it's also something with an overtly negative accent. And so the moment of negation is somewhat <clears throat> more prominent in this than there. But being a negation is being this, not that. It's being related to. And so the moment of negative relation is more prominent here than it is there. You can't be something than, although in fact, every something is always in relation to another. Hegel can't be a monist, because you can't have just one something. You can only have something with something else. So whatever it is, he's not a monist. Because there must minimally be two, something and something else. Remember, in the very nature of being, there must be two, something and something else. But nonetheless, something stands apart. And you can't say, that is something than that. No, it's just something. But you can say that's other than that. And that's because the moment of negative relation is more prominent here. And yet, 
The other is also just another on its own. So what does it mean for the other to be on its own? Hegel has some stuff in the, par in the paragraph uh, that follows that, that, that connects the idea of otherness to physical nature, which is I'm not going to bother with here. What I want to go to is the last paragraph, which is very concentrated. It moves at lightning speed from one thought to another. And you've got to slow it down and, and, and take each bit uh, by itself. So, first of all, the other simply by itself is the other in its own self. Okay, The other in its own self. But as other by itself, on its own, it's still other. And to be other still means being other than. But if the other is taken by itself, what can it be other than? It's taken by itself, remember, as just other. So if it's going to be other than, the only thing it can be other than is itself. The other taken by itself must be other than itself, which is what he now goes on to say. Hence, the other of itself, and so the other of the other. It is, therefore, that which is absolutely dissimilar within itself, that which negates itself and alters itself. Alteration is change. So Hegel's claim here is that the pure other, taken by itself, in being other than itself, is therefore the other of itself, is the other of the other, and the other of that other, and the other of that other, is the process of othering itself. The process of change. Remember that every something is also another, so that, mean, that means every something changes. Change is inherent in being something. This is becoming coming back again in the structure of something. We lost it when we went from becoming to Dasein and becoming disappeared. But now it's come back in again through uh, the other. Now, the German for the other is you know, das andere. And you can create a, a noun out of that. Per andere, which doesn't exist, but you can create it nonetheless which is the process of othering. If you just add the umlaut for end of on, and you've got the German for change. Now, I'm not, this is not meant to be a sort of linguistic trick. I don't think you know, Hegel will occasionally use etymologies and occasionally use dodgy etymologies, to be honest, but I don't think this is a case where he's using an etymology in that way to make a point. It's rather that the language reveals the logical point of issue. The change, as Hegel's conceiving it, is just the process of becoming other. The process of becoming other that's inherent in what it means to be other. If being other means, on the one hand, standing alone as just itself, and on the other hand, being other than. It must then mean being other than itself, being other than that, being other than that, and so the process of self other So that's quite dramatic. That wasn't what we were expecting. But Hegel thinks, therefore, that being something is being subject to change. Change is inherent in the very meaning of something. But note what change is understood to be here. Change is understood to be simply the process of becoming other than oneself. Notice what's absent. No reference to time. In Hegel's view, you don't need time to understand change. As we know, time comes in much later. Time is understood purely through the pro as the process. Sorry, change is understood. Change is understood as the process of becoming other than oneself. And becoming other than that. Also, for those of you who uh, work on um, Aristotle's notion of change, for example, or Kant, Kant's first analogy, You'll also be struck by what's missing here, which is any form of substrate. There's no substrate in this. The idea of a substrate for Hegel doesn't emerge until deep later on in the logic of measure, and then it comes back in the logic of essence. It has no role to play here at all. There is no substrate. 
inherent in the idea of change as Hegel's conceiving it. You don't have to have an underlying identity, as it were, the states of which alter. Because we haven't even got that distinction yet. So this is really quite important to think about. This is change understood purely as the process of becoming other. But the paragraph doesn't stop there. I mean, he makes no fuss about this. He just sort of goes straight on to the next idea. Which is that in altering itself, in becoming other than itself, the other, as he says, just remains identical with itself. For that into which it alters is the other, and this is its sole determination. But what is altered is not determined in any different way, but in the same way, namely to be another. In this latter, therefore, it only unites with its own self. So the something must alter in becoming other than itself, but in so doing, all it does is become the other again and again and again. The same old other. Endlessly the same old other. And so in fact, in so doing, it constitutes itself as self-identical in and through the process of change. So yes, there is an identity in change, but it doesn't underlie change. It's generated by change. Just as a matter of interest, you get a similar kind of structure, I think of this because it's been teaching it, in, in set certainty, when the now proves to be continuous, not as it were underlying the different moments, but in and through the move from one now to another, a continuity is established uh, through that process. Same is going on here. So something in the form of other must be a changing other, and as a changing other, it must give itself an identity. But what here is, what do we think by a self-identical determinant being? It's something. So something in changing constitutes itself as a self-identical something. And that's the claim. And it's all in that little paragraph. And it all follows from the very logic, he thinks, of being another. There's a lot buried in that, and a lot that you'll see coming up later. So I suppose, again, the idea that you can have different forms of change and dynamism without time, without a substrate, is important. The idea that change also generates an identity, a self-relating in the very process of the others becoming other than itself. We'll also find later, when we get to the finite and the uh, infinite, in a sense it's kind of prefiguring what the true infinite will be. But Hegel thinks that this structure here moves us on to two new concepts. And this is a really, I won't say it's completely obscure, but it's a hard transition. It seems to me of all the transitions we've had, this is perhaps the most difficult so far. The two concepts we're going towards are being in itself and being for other. So the message, as it were, that he's setting out here is that the something that emerges through the process of change will be a something that has an intrinsic identity, an anzi sign, and also that is other related. So it won't be a pure something anymore. And it won't just be a something that, as it were, happens to stand next to something else. It will be a something that has other relatedness in its very structure. You know, think of Heideggerian and Mitzayn. You don't, in a sense, you don't. Mitzayn is grounded in Dasein. You don't sort of need something else first for something to be Mitzayn. You're Mitzayn from Dasein. Well, being for other will be the same. It will be an internal relation to something else. Okay, so how the heck do we get from 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 here to there, as it were. Um, well, the logic is set out in the next uh, sentence. I'll read you the sentence and then maybe give you a very, yeah, because I haven't got much time, very brief going over it, and then we'll go over it more clearly next time. So Hegel's argument is this. The other is thus posited as reflected into itself with sublation of the otherness, of being other, as a self-identical something from which consequently the otherness which at the same time as the moment of it is distinct, the from it is redundant, and does not appertain to the something itself. That's a mouthful. But there are two thoughts that he's getting at here. The other 
in changing and becoming other than itself, relates to itself, and so is reflected into itself, and so constitutes itself as an identical something, through the sublation of otherness. Through not just being other. It is the process of self-othering, but in relating to itself, it's not just other. So it's a self-identical something from which, consequently, otherness is distinct because the something isn't just being other. And yet, that otherness is a moment of it. And it's in those two thoughts that you can see Anzigstein and being for other. So insofar as the something that emerges in this process is a something through not just being other, it's reflected back into just being something. Something, Hegel's going to say, something in itself. But insofar as it is reflected back into itself through the very movement of being other than, then being other than is constitutive of the something that arises. So that is something constituted as being other related. So you get a fundamental ambiguity coming out of this. The something is generated by the process of self-othering in a twofold way, as not just the other being something in itself, and as constituted by being other as other related. So this new something, then, if you look under two, I won't because the time's running short, you can see the first and second paragraph end with the statement that this something is a being for other. <coughs> Ein sein für anderes, where für just means related to. So the something is now internally related to another. It's other related. It's intrinsic. In the same way you get with Leibniz, you, know, you get internal related. But in the third paragraph, something is a being in itself, an ansich sein, not an in sich sein, but an ansich sein. And those two are interesting because they are aspects of being something that are the beginnings of something's becoming determinate. So what does it mean for something to be determinate? Well, it's going to mean that something has to have an intrinsic identity and it has to relate to other things in a certain way. And those two initially are distinct from one another, but what you get in the section on determination of constitution is that they gradually come together and in fact one turns into the other. And so a thing's intrinsic being gets bound up with its other relatedness and its other relatedness comes to constitute its intrinsic being such that they become dialectically interconnected. And that's where we're headed and the goal of that Hegel will claim is that any something has to be limited. There's a lot there, and I think that's probably a good point uh, to, well, we have to stop anyway, but it's a good point to stop. Um, what I would suggest is go over the something and other, see if you can make sense of this transition, and then look at being in itself and being for other, go straight through into determination, constitution, and limit. If you have time, read the section on finitude, but then stop there. I'll see you tomorrow, I hope, for Andrew Cooper and Kant. Otherwise, have a good week. <laughs>